All right. Welcome back to the Home Service Expert. Today, I got a good buddy of mine. This guy's a genius in home service. Uh, Ken Haynes is visiting from the Atlanta market. He's an expert in marketing, operations, resources, and support, leadership, mergers and acquisitions, and business growth. He's been the CEO at Wrench Group from 2016 to present, and he's also the owner-operator of Cool Ray Heating and Cooling uh, from 2003 Ken Haynes was appointed CEO of Wrench Group in 2016, transitioning from the owner of CEO of Cool Ray, which he held since 2003. Ken brings with him 44 years of experience in the home service industry. Since CEO of Wrench, Ken's leadership of the Wrench Group has guided the company to become one of the largest non franchises home service companies in the United States, growing the organization from $165 million to over a billion in six years. <laughs> Your reputation... Your reputation precedes you, my friend. This is uh, pretty crazy. Uh, big fan of yours. Got to meet you several times. Uh, we've talked on the phone for years now. What's uh, what's new with you? What's what's going on? No, like I said, just first off, thanks for having me, Tommy. It's great to great to join you today. Congratulations to you for all, all you've been been up to a lot over the last several years and have made great strides in, in the garage, garage door business. So uh, hats off to uh, you, my friend. But no, thanks for having me. It's been busy. It's been it's been a great ride. Been doing this for a long time, and um, you know we're, we're trying to we're trying to build a real company here, and and we're doing some acquisitions, a little bit of a little bit of greenfield, a little bit of organic. You know, it's kind of a mixed bag, but we've, we're fortunate. We've got great partners and uh, great companies and great markets. So. Um, just more of the same. Just got to keep on growing. We get this thing to three billion. That's, That's the plan. plan. Three billion. I'm just trying to get this to share yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. So we'll we'll you know we'll do we'll do about 1.2 this year, and uh, you know we'll continue to grow uh, organically as our main focus. Uh, sprinkled in with some uh, M and A and some other things, and uh, yeah, I mean it, uh, you know I think three three billions in our sites. It's gonna take a little while to get there, but I think we can do it. Such a big space. So there's so much to talk to you about here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've got a lot of questions. Uh, what was the transition like going from Cool Ray, which you did all in for about 13 years? How big did you get Cool Ray to 2016? So I, 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 you know, just to back up maybe a little bit, I, I was fortunate and, and I had the right time, right place. Sometimes it just works out that way. Uh, cool Ray was owned by, uh, the business that I work for, uh, my employer. And in 2003, well, actually in 2000, they had relocated me from Florida to Atlanta because it wasn't doing so well. They wanted me to, to fix it. It's broken. And um, so I moved up here in 2000. And by 2003, uh, our parent went bankrupt. And my phone rang one day and they said, how would you like to buy Cool Ray? I thought about it for about a half a second. And so <laughs> I, I, I would. And so uh, not to bore you with, with, with the story, but, but Cool Ray was a big new construction business. It, it, when we acquired them in, in, two, in 1990, 1997, it wasn't doing so well. I shut it down in 99 and 2000 and was left with a $5 million retail business. So when I bought the business in 2003, we were about $5 million. And um, uh, I took it to about $60 million in, uh, in those, those 12 years. You know, the, the transition was easy. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I'd been in the space and, and, and did just about everything you can do uh, in a business from starting out as a service technician in my early days in the late 70s uh, to running call centers and operations and sales, sales folks and uh, to, the, to the front office. And it was a fairly easy it was a fairly easy leap for me, uh, you know, in, in the point of me in July of 16. And I've got a lot of questions just around what you did with it because I kind of understand your acquisition style and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're trying to buy some of the best companies and you're not just saying you're going to adopt everything, but there is a reporting factor, but you're basically saying you're a great leader. You grow, build a great business. You're going to use our resources, but we're not going to change everything. Can you explain kind of the fundamentals of that acquisition style? So, yeah, so we, we are, and not only is it an acquisition style, but I think it's fundamentally um, 
how we operate and how we think about things. Uh, we are definitely a differentiated platform, as, as your listeners know. There's a lot of private equity in the space. Uh, you know, we kind of started this in, in 15. We were the first ones, really, uh, in late 15 to, to embark on this private equity owned, and a lot, a lot of, you know, followed suit. But you know, first and foremost, we we want to partner with great companies, with great cultures, in great markets, with, you know, long track records of top line and bottom line growth. They don't have to be the biggest in a market, but they have to be really well run businesses. Um, and then we want those owners to stay. We want them to stay. They, they've done a great job. You know, the reason we partner with these businesses is because they've done a great job. We want them to stay. And to get folks to stay, you can't come in and turn the business upside down, take away all the entrepreneurial ship that got them where, where they are today. Um, and you, and you can't tie their hands up. You got to let them run the business. Having said that, we are building, you know, we're not a federation of companies all over the country. There's there's some, what I like to say, non-negotiables, some things that we're focused on. But to a large extent, it doesn't feel all that different when you partner with Wrench. You still run your business, you roll equity in Wrench, so you take some chips off the table, uh, you roll some equity into the, the big business, and then you come along for that ride. Uh, so financially, uh, it's a great opportunity as well, but we are a little different. We don't centralize for the sake of centralization. There's some standardization. Um, we like to say we we buy we partner with great businesses, buy those companies, and then we pour you know jet fuel on a raging fire. How do we make them even better? With a lot of collaboration, a lot of best practice sharing, centers of excellence, et cetera. And that's really kind of how we think about it. But fundamentally, we don't go in and turn a culture upside down. Um, and, you know, we want these businesses to continue to flourish rather than, just, you know, it's got to, it's got to be one plus one equals three, not one plus one equals one and a half. Right. And which is what happens in a lot of cases. So I've got a concept and tell me what you think about this is, is the concept is if I was pursuing you, Ken, and you were much smaller in the garage door space. And I said to you, listen, why don't you tell me what you love to do more than anything in the world? What are the three main things you love? Is it recruiting and training? Is it going and finding other companies to partner with? Is it your commercial accounts? Is it just, but, but, and then what do you hate the most? Is it accounting? Is it HR? And then really try to build your dream role that you love to come to work on Mondays and take all the other yeah. nonsense away. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, if I, if, I, if you come to me and I'm and I'm an owner operator and you want to you want to partner, you want to acquire my business, you know, I, I want to know what life's going to look like post close once the ink is dry. And the first the first of the three, I think, would be I want to have fun. You know, I have fun. I mean, sure, business is hard. It's it's tough work. There's ups and downs. There's frustrations. You know, there's everything that goes along with owning a business and growing a business. Clearly. But it's fun. It's fun to grow something. So I want to have fun. So I want to make sure I understand what the environment's going to look like down the road. And can I still have fun? I want to. I want to continue to have the freedom, to a large extent, to continue to do what I what I do well, and that's run the business. I also want to. I want to make sure that it's an environment where I can help lead and coach, and you know bring people along. You know what what. What I get out of this, I think, and what I'm so proud of with the Wrench Group and what we've done is we've we've changed so many lives. You know, you, you it's great to have folks that work for you that you bring in and you and you help develop them, bring them along. And maybe they're running the business someday or maybe they're your number two or whatever the case may be. They have an opportunity to get some ownership or, you know, to really do well financially for, for themselves and their families. That's what gets me excited. And that's what I'm super proud of that we've done that at Ranch several times now as we've we've gone through various sales you know iterations. Um, so you got got to have fun and and you got to be able to do what you love to do and bring people along. I think those are the two biggest things for me. I, I you know, um, and I don't want to be micromanaged you know, along with that. Let me do my job. I'm not looking for a boss. I get it when you sell your business. There's things change, um, but you want to partner with me because I assume uh, this example that you know that we're a great business and we'd be a great fit and you want you want me to continue to do what what 
what's made us so successful thus far. Uh, so I think those would be those would be the three things. But I, I don't hate anything. I mean, I, you know, my background is a service tech. I grew up in the business, turning a wrench and then learning along the way. I didn't go to college. My long story: parents wanted me to go, but didn't go. I ended up starting a business at 19 years old uh, up in the Northeast in air conditioning and major appliance repair. It's kind of how I got in. Um, and um, you know, looking back, uh, th- thank God I did that. I don't know that I'd be where I am today if I ended up going to school, but. Um, so in any event, I, you know, I've done just about everything you can do in the business. But I love, op- I'm an operator at heart. I mean, I love operations. I just love, I love looking at situations and, and creating, whether it's processes or new platforms, ways to get things done, making them more efficient, make them more productive, uh, make them better. I'm not a finance guy. I was, obviously, I know numbers and you have to, uh, but it's not my love. I don't love to stare at spreadsheets all day. It's not, not what I like to do. I like to get my hands dirty, if you will, and get out in front of people and, and uh, I'm an operator. So there's a lot of different styles out there. Some guys like to go like Ken Goodrich. He, he, sometimes he buys broken companies, not completely broken, but uh, you can look at a lot of things. You could say, what's your average ticket? What's your conversion rate? What's your uh, booking rate? And what does it cost you to acquire a customer? Plus we're buying better than you. If we could help fix those because you've got a centralized good CRM or, you know, there is a strategy of just taking companies and putting your kind of infrastructure on it, which is better. It doesn't mean you got to change everything, but you got to say, is this better for everybody? Do they get to make more money? Do they get to go on vacations and have PTO and have a 401k and drive new trucks? We just did a deal in Denver and the guy said, wait a minute, you pay weekly and you give us new trucks. That's all we care about. Then we gave them the tools. But the, because in my industry, there's not a lot of, you know, five, 10, 20 million dollar EBITDA companies out there. I mean, those are hard to find. What's your take on the, the different strategies out there? You know, I think I think that, I think there's look, there's different ways to, to skin the cat. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I come from my background, you know, as you know, our space, the, the home services space, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, there's, there, there was an attempt in the 90s to to roll it up, if you will, consolidate. I hate, I hate those words because it's really not what we do. Um, and it failed. And, you know, if we learned anything from then, we learned what not to do. And I swore when I when I interviewed for this role in, in early 16 with uh, InvestCorp, which was really our first uh, private equity um, partner, I told them, I said, this, uh, this is not, this is how we're going to run the business because it's not going to work. You know, they were new to the space and I'd been in the space 30 years already, uh, or more, uh, you know, 30, I think I'm 45 years now. So probably 30, 38, 39 years. I said, here's how we're going to do it. It's not going to be a roll up. It's not going to work. It will not work. It's not sustainable. I want to build a business that when I'm long gone, this thing can, is continuing to flourish and grow. If I walk out the door and a handful of our team walks out the door and it falls apart, we, we, we clearly, you know, didn't build this thing with legs. And so, Having said that, there are different ways of doing it. There's other private equity owned platforms in our space and outside of our space that that have more of a roll up mentality where everything is done from corporate. They take the autonomy out, uh, a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit out. They put a lot of systems in place and and here's the book. Here's how you do it. It's just not for us. I mean, I think there are certain things you have to do to to standardize. Some things may be even centralized, Um, but I think you have to be very strategic around that and make sure you, you we, we, we don't do anything that impacts our people. I, I, anything that's going to change the culture or, or, for example, we don't drive pay plans from Atlanta. Corporate, Wrench Group Corporate is not telling Parker and Sons in Arizona, in your backyard, uh, what to pay people. And we don't say, well, you know, we pay differently in, in Northern California or in Florida, so you have to do it that way. So we're going to make it all the same. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. There's no benefit of that outside of saying we've centralized it or standardized it. Um, you know, and so things, that's just one example of, of things we're just very careful about, but but others have other strategies, right? You know, you mentioned Kent Goodrich. I know they buy some broken businesses. I'd, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather pay top dollar for a great, for a great business uh, and make it even better. I, I don't have the time to fix stuff. I, you know, sometimes businesses break and you have to fix them, but I don't want to buy broken businesses 
uh, you know, out of the gate. It's just not, it's just not what we do. So you mentioned you're able to do one plus one equals three. Obviously, you guys got buying power through Service Titan, through every major HVAC plumbing company out there that you're able to use the buying power of the whole. You guys are probably able to get better insurance plans. You guys are probably better to get a better price on vehicles. And and there's probably 27 softwares I use at A1. And we're able to give that buying power. But what else? Obviously, there's some insights for marketing because you're able to use a BI tool examine certain personas and how to market using everybody's data and culmination. I think you guys use Power BI or you might have used Domo a while ago. We're moving. We're moving. We're actually moving from Domo to Power BI now as we speak. Yeah. It, okay. So, so you've got a lot of insights. Um, there's obviously probably some, some recruiting the, the power of the team. Where, where would you say the biggest movement comes from, the wrench group versus well, you know, for the new partner. Yeah. So we, we really focus on, on five key enablers, five things, five levers, if you will, that we, we like to focus on. Uh, one is around finance and operations, right? Uh, a lot of collaboration. It's, it's the power of wrench. It's, 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 we've got a lot of smart people across the organization that are really successful to fill incredible businesses. They all do things a little bit differently. So there's not one best practice. So, so there's a lot of collaboration or in, in, in what we call these centers of excellence, people who lead these user groups, if you will, in the organization to help one another, whether it's how to sell HVAC or how to, you know, how to increase your margins, or how to run a call center, um, how to market. I mean, I, you know, just a handful, there's about 20 of them. Uh, and they're led by, typically by location leadership uh, and supported by corporate, we help facilitate it. So a lot around operations around collaboration. Sure, we, we do benefit from, we, we haven't centralized purchasing the way you th- you're thinking about it, but we leverage our purchasing. There is an opportunity there, but it, it's difficult to do. It's one thing that we'd rather focus on some other things. I'd rather focus on things that are going to help grow the business at, you know, 20 to 30% a year versus how do I save one or two million by buying a little better and, and making everyone's life miserable in the process? Changing people's garage door brand, right? People, you know, it's amazing how folks will fall over a sword because they love genie, you know, versus overhead, or you know, they love carrier over train, or it, it's unbelievable. But we let, but we we still find ways to leverage the OEM. Same thing on trucks. We have a national fleet manager, uh, so we do we do leverage a handful of things. But it's not a at the end of the day, that's not what that's not what takes us, you know, from a a $200 million EBITDA business to a $400 million EBITDA business. It's our ability to grow this business organically and be smart about it. So things around finance and operations. One of the things that, that a lot of your listeners probably don't have great insights to today, same thing in the, in the HVAC plumb electrical space is data. A lot of these businesses are kind of run by the seat of the pants. I think Service Titan's done great helping the industry, but we want real-time data um, that, that helps our operators understand what's going on today, not the 29th of the month when it's too late and the month is over, it's real time. Uh, and it's through the entire business, whatever you want to look at and data aggregation tools like Domo or BI, Power BI help do that. And we use this internal you know, uh, uh, data lake or data warehouse, which houses, takes information out of Titan into that lake. And then from there we can go get it and do what we want with it all in real time. So a lot of work around finance, making, making sure people know we're looking at numbers. We're finding a lot of feedback, a lot of insights as to what's going on. Things that most owners didn't have or didn't know what they don't know. They're not sure what they need to be looking at. So we help shine a bright light on that. Another one is IT. You know, we, we used to have all these disparate systems. We now have one platform that's Service Titan. Uh, so as people join, uh, they all get on, they're all onto the platform, onto our instance, onto our financial book of record, and then we use then we use Power BI and a host of other software. So it's going to some, so having commonality around software and IT, uh, cybersecurity. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, a lot, you know, it's the biggest, if you look at, if you look at our staff at corporate, we have roughly 60 people. Half of that is, is IT focused. So there's a lot of work, a lot of investments 
around IT. So that'd be a big change at the location, getting them on our getting them on our platform. A lot of folks already on Titan, we acquire them because Titan's made such a you know such great inroads, but they're using QuickBooks and they don't really use the system very well. So we help them, you know, use the system as it's designed. Marketing is another one. Uh, while we don't centralize marketing, you know, we're, we own all things digital at corporate, uh, along with our data lake and Adobe cloud stack. Uh, we have some really interesting insights into our, into our, our data. Uh, and, and we've been on this digital transformation journey for four years now. It's painful, uh, but we're starting to get some of the, some of the benefits and see some of the rewards from that. So marketing is another big one. Uh, and then of course, you know, we're focused on strategic M and A, you know, partnering uh, with, with more great partners in markets. So another big piece, and then you have human capital, right? I mean, there's two things that prevent you from growing one, your ability to spend money in market, to make the phone ring. And the other one is having capacity and, and you gotta have both, right? You gotta make the phone ring. And when you do make the phone ring, you, you got to be able to get out to people. And in the HVAC space, and it's 118 degrees in Phoenix, you can't tell people, I'll see you in a week. Uh, so you got to be same day, next day, year round, regardless of the weather. And so we've, we've got this shared service um, concept around recruiting, uh, where we own recruiting a corporate to, to an extent, the, the, the locations on the last mile, if you will. Uh, but we're, we've shined a, a, a floodlight on recruiting. Uh, and as a result, it, it's paid dividends and, and, you know, we've been able to bring you here stories around shortage of people in the trades. And while that's true, you know, they're working for somebody. We just got to get them working for us. And so that's been another big focus. So we own that area of HR and then benefits and stuff like that. You know, you know, we're self-insured around, around health and 401k and handbooks and, you know, some of that sort of, that, that sort of stuff. It's really those five enablers. And then there's, those details underneath those five areas. Outside of that, we let the businesses run. You, you know, the only problem, and tell me, I'm sure you ran into this, but if you've got different pay grades per market, do you guys ever let a Parker and Sons move to Atlanta and vice versa for a change? Because then you're like, oh, well, now you're going to make less because we pay different here. It just... To me, it seems like you've taken a lot of stuff in-house and you almost want them growing into the whole company. Now, I know that there's some some pros and cons and we could do a whole SWOT analysis on this, but what do you do with that circumstance? Every mark, every market's different. Cost of, li cost of living is different in California. It's obviously probably the highest in the country. Um, and what folks make in in you know LA is probably different from what they make in Sarasota, Florida. Benefits are the same, 401k is the same, health's the same. Uh, the pay grade may be slightly different. But so to answer your question, yes, you can transfer within, right? With the, well, one company. So we encourage that, obviously. We want folks to stay. And if they want to relocate, great. Come on and keep your tenure and everything. You know, whether they're making $20 an hour or $24 an hour, you just you work through it. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that often where it creates a big issue. But the fact is, pay grade, I mean, I, it's not going to be exactly the same because market dynamics and cost of living varies from, from state to state, market to market. It just does. So, you know, when I think about the Godfathers and I'm switching up a little bit, but that's a great answer. And that's absolutely true. I just, I've got so much to ask. So I'm just going to keep firing questions at you. Um, HVAC spells wealth, Ron. He was really doing different things in you know, 60s and 70s. Is that somebody you, you've spent time with? You know, Tommy, I missed the name. Who's the name? Uh, Ron um, HX Bells. Ron well. Smith? Yeah, Ron Smith. Uh, Roswell, Atlanta guy. I, I love Ron Smith. You know, I've worked with Ron a little bit. Um, he owned a business called Service America uh, down in, uh, and there was another name for it, down in, in southwest Florida. I want to say Naples, Fort Myers area. And, yeah, it was. Yep. Yeah, and one of the first companies I I worked for when I when I moved from the Northeast to Florida in the um, in the eighties, uh, we were owned by a business. Uh, we, we were a sister company of Roto Rooter. Everybody knows who Roto Rooter is. And we were changing our name, uh, and we hired Ron, and we, we actually bought the name 
Service America from Ron uh, because we were, we were going national. We, we couldn't protect the name we had at the time uh, in all states. In Service America, we could. And then we also, had, we, we were a service contract business. We sold service contracts to folks on fixed incomes, but retirees that had relocated primarily from north to Florida. And we sold these full, fully insured, if you will, service contracts. But we wanted to get into the retail space. So we found out there wasn't a ton of money in, in just selling the insurance piece and doing all the work. And so we hired Ron to help launch us into, into retail sales. Uh, we worked with Ron and his daughter. I can't recall his daughter's name now, um, who worked for him for a long time. In fact, she may be, she's now involved, I think, with, with CAG, um, Condition Hair Association of Georgia. Her name escapes me, darn it. But in any event, so I, you know, look, Ron, Ron was big, and it's a big thing for me uh, and for Ranch. Ron was big into service agreements or service ma or maintenance plans. And that's a big part of Wrench's business. And I am a, I think it's single-handedly the most important thing you can do if you're in a, a business that, that you can lock people in, make the relationship sticky, build a fence around their home. It's great for the customer, but it's also great for the company and it keeps your techs working year round. So we learned a lot about, about the importance of maintenance from Ron. And, and, and frankly, when you look at lifetime, lifetime value of a maintenance agreement customer versus a non, which, you know, because we love relational versus transactional, right? Uh, you know, the difference in lifetime value is incredible. And so it's a big part of a business, keeps our techs working when, when our competitors uh, are unable to because it's a shoulder month and it's slow and there's no demand for, for HVAC uh, specifically. But so we learned a lot from Ron on maintenance and he was in, Ron's got a whole book on maintenance agreements. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we learned a lot from Ron. I like Ron Smith quite a bit. He's a, he's a legend. You know, the, there's a lot of people came out of the Jim Abram days, even Alan Rohr. I mean, really there's so much that got built off of that. And then, you know, right around the same time, Frank Blau and George Brazil were working on next star. What, what is your take on that? There's a lot there, but I'm just curious. And I know you're not going to, belittle anybody but just what is your take you said some stuff have gone south in the past but overall there was some success out of like next star is amazing for a lot of people but what is your take i asked you two two questions in once well really what was one hour air benjamin franklin and mr sparky and then you know the next stars of the world well i think i think one hour was an operator for the most part right i mean you know a lot of these you know contract of 2000 became next star You've got the other one, Airtime 500. I don't know much about them, honestly. Uh, I, I think Nexstar is phenomenal. Uh, I, I, we, we all go on the Nexstar. We've got some really big, bit, and we don't we don't require or shove it down our location heads' throats to, to participate. Frankly, I mean, you know, Parker and Sons is, is a giant in in Phoenix. I don't know that they're going to benefit a lot from a Nexstar, but we have lots of companies. Uh, that that benefit and participate in some of the training. They do a great job. They 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 churn incredible businesses. Uh, they provide fantastic support. Uh, they help they help a lot of folks get from startup all the way to 20, 30 million plus. Uh, lots of Morris Jenkins, for example, in Charlotte, arguably one of the best operated HVAC uh, companies in America. Part of the Wrench Group uh, belong to belong to Nextar. Uh, back in the day and learned a lot, adopted a lot of their, a lot of their systems and tools and processes. And so, but I think you do get to a point when you get to a certain size, you may outgrow it. Um, that said, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a business that's, you know, 50 million ish, maybe even a little more and less, uh, you know, you should belong. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of what Julian Scad and his team are doing at next star. They're trying to figure out how to deal with the whole private equity in the space. Uh, stuff, but th they will. I'm confident they will. And again, I don't know much about airtime. Uh, well, Frank, I know Frank Blau, uh, but never met, may have met Frank once 20 years ago. Um, but look, I think they all have their place. They all, they all have memberships. They offer, they offer good tools and programs, but it's like anything else. It, you know, you go to these meetings and you take a lot of notes and you get really excited and then you come home and you don't execute. So if you can't execute on this stuff, 
uh, what's the point? And that, and that's, and I think it's probably a frustration from a lot of these, these, these uh, affinity groups that teach this stuff. And then, all right, let's, we got to get it implemented. And that's where people struggle is in the implementation. Yeah, Julian does a fantastic job. I admire him very, very much. And uh, he's always been a great friend of mine. And he definitely deserves a thousand shout outs because he's doing an amazing work there in Minnesota. And he comes from Atlanta. You know, he's got a great yeah, story. Right down right down the street from where I sit right now. You know, you brought up Morris Jenkins. And <laughs> I'm curious. I never got an opportunity to meet those guys. And I've heard amazing things. What is your take on Roy Williams? Uh, you know, I know Roy. I, I, li I like Roy. I, I, I started working with Roy. I never hired Roy to help me when I owned Cool Ray. But one of, one of, a good friend of mine who also works for one of the big, uh, big 50,000 watt sticks here in, in Atlanta, radio station, uh, AM Talk. Because, uh, you know, we did a lot of radio. I think Cool Ray still does a fair amount of radio. I'm a fan of spoken word versus music because I think people are listening when it's spoken word versus listening to music and dial hopping. But and he was my he he ended up helping me out a lot in marketing and he he knew Roy Williams and so I went to some of the early on uh, Roy Roy you know I'm trying to think Wizard of Ads and there's a, there's a handful of courses I did out in Austin. This is before Roy. You ever been to Roy's place? Oh yeah. Yeah, so this, this is before he had the big compound, you know, with the, yeah. you know, with the whole people get married on top of the hill, and this is this is when he was in a different place. And man, you go in, and it's eight o'clock in the morning, and the wine is chilled, the beer is chilled, the music's blasting, and he's an amazing guy, he's very very smart, all left brain, right brain, um, and he wanted to do work with us, but I, I just my style of marketing was different than what he was selling. And I, and I just couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't get there. Uh, but that said, I think I learned a lot from, from some of his courses. I don't think he teaches much these days. Uh, he's got folks that do it, but um, yeah. So I, 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 look, I respect Roy. I, he's helped. He's, he's obviously he did a great job from Morris Jenkins uh, over the years building, helped to build that brand uh, with, with Dewey and, the, and, and, all the all the advertisements. Do you recall the advertisements with with the kid who was in the truck with him most of the time? You know, I, with, I've with, heard a bunch of stuff. Yeah, from Mr. Jenkins. Roy, I've read his books, and yeah, he, he went on the Hollywood. He went, the, the guy went on the Hollywood. I'm not sure what he's doing, but it actually launched an acting career for this kid. He was an employee. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I like Roy. I think he's a great marketer. Um, that same friend still works works for him today. Actually works for him directly now uh, versus one of, one of his disciples. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, look, I think Roy's in the space. He's, he, he does, a, he does work for a bunch of, bunch of organizations. And I think he's doing, I think he's doing a good job. So get, th this is a tough question and I know you're not probably prepared because you've got a lot of mentors and people you look up to. One of mine is Al Levy. He came in and helped me out a lot. The seven power contractor, but you know, I love Jack Welch and he, you know, built to last is not build a company that falls apart when you leave, which you discuss. Uh, but is there people that have really worked that you look up to with personal relationships that you just, th they've left a big impact and created a catalyst for you to grow? You know, I think I, yeah, so I wasn't expecting that question. So a good one. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the person I think has made the biggest difference in my life. And it's, it, it'll sound cliche. It's my father. I mean, I think I don't have anyone in business. I mean, obviously I follow a lot of these guys. You mentioned a couple of names, but really it's, it's, it's what my, it, it's my mother and father really um, in what they instilled in me in terms of work ethic uh, and how to act and, and the kind of person uh, that I hope I've become. Uh, and, and, it and it transcends into business that I think has really helped me be successful. Uh, I've had some good mentors too. I mean, look, I I worked for companies, a guy named Pat Johnson, who is a CEO, the old CEO of, of, uh, of Blue Dot Services, that took a took a chance uh, on me back in the day when he probably he probably shouldn't have in terms of my experience and the role he gave me. Um, but I've worked I've worked with some really smart people, uh, and I listen, and I think that's a, a, a 
the trait that that leaders need to have uh, if you want to be a good leader is to be able is, is is you know listening to people and so but I but I think I, it would be my parents really that I would that I would look to and I look at my father who never missed a day of work in twenty something years traveling on 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 a railroad an hour and a half every day up at four thirty in the morning traveling into New York City uh, for a mundane job and never missed a day and I had the same job for all that time I mean that's incredible yeah I mean it's unheard of today who does that so um, yeah that, that's probably who I would who I would uh, that's a good great great answer for that yeah. I really appreciate that and uh you know I think my dad gave me the inspiration my mom gave me the love to always have my back even when days weren't going so good her love and care it, you know it's a great it, sometimes you don't you, you know some people don't mention them and it's important you you talked about something i'm very interested in and, and by the way i know i sent you a lot of questions um those were if i didn't have <laughs> those were <laughs> plan b uh but for you i can bet you i could talk for hours so Talk to me about commercial new construction, Home Depot, and then retail retro space, because I think there's still a lot of people that listen and tune into the podcast that are like, you can make a lot of money in new construction. And then I look at their books. We focus on their EBITDA, EBITDA, whatever, that million people call it different things. I'm like, you're really not making money. And I think there's some ways to make money or you're running home warranty calls or whatever it might be. But you took a retail, you, you took a, a new construction company, and shifted it. Explain the concepts, uh, and how to really let people understand that concept. Yeah, well, the two businesses are very, very, very different. And you know, pri prior to <clears throat> having the opportunity to buy Cool Ray, I was I was a regional vice president of operations, and we had I had a lot of new construction, <clears throat> excuse me, companies in my region. And what I discovered early on is, you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to do both really well. If you if you're really good at new construction, and that's your thing, uh, and that's your focus, then it could be okay, and you can make money. You're not going to have great margins, and you're probably always going to be dealing with bad debt and cash flow issues because your money's tied up with builders, and you know, and and they're in your pockets all the time uh, on chargebacks, and so it's a very frustrating business. But also, I think it takes more people. It's a little more. It's a little more labor intensive. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to have a business. <clears throat> I found, and I've witnessed and seen. It's hard to have both under the same roof. It's hard. It's hard to be a leader and say and be really good at new construction, and then having a retail division focused on, you know, break fix, you know, service, maintenance, repairs, install, all three trades related services, maybe even garage. I mean, it's just, it's just hard to do and it's a different mindset. And so I, 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 have, I haven't seen with the exception of maybe one and two, I haven't seen a lot very, not that it can't, can't be successful, but I just haven't seen a lot. For me, and we don't have any new construction uh, at the wrench group really at all. I mean, we're 99.9% um, single family homeowner, uh, you know, business. And so a little bit of commercial, which I'm not opposed to, not big, heavy stuff, chillers and all that. It's just not our, it's just not our thing. We're not good at it. Um, but I haven't seen a lot be very successful. So to me, it's just, it, 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 because the margins are, are, you know, subpar in my mind, we just, we've made a decision. You're tied, you're tied more to the economy. Obviously when the economy is bad, there's less home starts. Uh, so people are buying less. So you're, you are tied. Um, kind of like home improvement, you're tied to the ups and downs, uh, those cycles, you know, in, in some other spaces like plumbing, you know, we love to say toilets break during recessions, right? HVAC units break during recessions, water heaters break during recessions, garage doors break during recessions. You gotta be able to get your car in and out. You gotta be able to, you need air conditioning, you need heat. And so not that we're recession proof, but we are certainly recession resistant new homes are not right. And so it's, it's more risk and, and, and I don't like the risk. And so, uh, we've made a decision, uh, you know, strategic decision to not, not do new construction. Now, will that change someday? If I run across a business that has really gotten it figured out and managed and structured in such a way where we can kind of separate it, 
never say never, you know, you never know. Uh, but that's kind of my spin on, on new construction. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't like, I don't like bad debt. Uh, I don't like having a bill. I love COD getting paid same day. Uh, you know, and it's just, it's just a, from a cash flow standpoint, it's better for business, you know, all the reasons. So that's my spin on or take on, on RNC with respect to what we call retail, which is Home Depot's and Costco's of the world, Lowe's of the world. Again, we're very strategic there. Um, we like the space, but we like it a certain way. Um, it, can, it can only be a certain size relative to the total. Uh, it, it won't be where it's 30, 40, 50% where one customer is massive and, and which, which poses a lot of risk if, if they fall out of bed and lose that business. So that'll never happen, sort of like an ARS where you know, they've, they've over the years, it's just become this monster. Um, to me, that's risk I don't want to take. So it's got to be a certain amount, no more than a certain amount of our sales. Uh, one customer, no more than a certain percent. And then in total, amongst a, a set of customers, no more than a little bit more than that. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, it has to stand on its own two feet. There's a term in, the, in that business called flipping sales, which companies will take their, that, that participate in the program will take their own sales and they'll give them to one of the retail stores so they can hit their numbers. I said, look, we're not going to do that. That's just, if we can't figure out a way to make the program work, we can't get our close rates up. We can't get our average orders up. We can't make it where it stands on its own two feet. Then we're not going to do it. We figured out how to make it work. Uh, and it's become a it's become a, a, a good part of a business. Home Depot and Costco are, are two great partners of us. We love working with them. We have a great relationship. Uh, we 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 use it also to expand into new markets when we, uh, as part of our greenfield initiative, uh, and that's worked well. It gives us an instant jump start in markets where we're starting from scratch with no brand at all. Um, so we we love the relationship. Um, it's, you know, I'm hopeful that it will continue on. Uh, but it is strategic in how we how we think about those partnerships. So I'm not going to ask you for the secret sauce when it comes to those box store agreements. But here's a question. And I think it's a little bit different in garage doors. But we have stickers, big ones on your garage, big ones on your opener, hopefully mm -hmm. on the wall. And those are impressions you're seeing every day. And I know some new construction companies that get 70 calls a day, but they don't want to run them. They're like, uh, because they're not good at retail. Yeah. I think there's a real big opportunity there of somebody that's generating 50. They've been there 40 years. They got stickers on every door. They hate retail. There's an opportunity to work with those companies. Now, do you want to take on the new construction? Maybe not. Just, I think if you get them on the service Titan and show them they're running around in circles for no money and they didn't realize it and you get them on intact and you point out you're actually losing money you just didn't have the accounting figured out it's not really a hard decision and i'm not trying to convince you i'm just wondering if you have any insights if someone's getting well 70 calls a day without google well it, you know look it's interesting and in fact the bigger you know if you're gonna make a decision to do new construction and retail the biggest decision point in that would be, in my mind, you just said it, is the fact that you get access to all these future customers, right? That's the one thing that these businesses don't do well. So the whole reason for doing new construction, because you're, you're sacrificing margins, but you're, you're building this big database of, of, of future uh, homeowners that are going to buy from you, right? Now there's rules around, you can't just stick your, at least back in the day, I don't, it may have changed, but a lot of the builders don't allow you to, to sticker up their home, if you will, until the home sells and it's out of warranty. Then you can reach back out to them. But certainly, if you had the ability to, to, to sticker the house up, uh, which is obvious who installed the garage doors, it's obvious who installed the HVAC system. They're looking at the system. It's got the big old sticker on it. Uh, and then market to them as well. That's a, that's a tremendous benefit and reason you may want to do new construction. But it's the single, it's the one thing that these owner the operators did not do well. And it's the biggest reason you would be in the space. So um, now 
you know, times have changed a little bit from from the '90s and, and 2000s. But but that said, I mean, it's it, you're right. It is it is you know, it's a captive audience per se. And if you can get in there early enough and start doing maintenance, I mean, there's certainly maintenance that needs to be done on garage doors. I'm assuming you, you know you you guys sell maintenance plans. If not, you ought to. Uh, I'm sure you're all over that. But you know, you want you want the relationship sticky. Uh, you don't want them to forget who their garage door company is. Same with us, uh, but that would be the one reason that I would I would agree with you. That's the one reason that you may want to you may want to do new construction. To me, there's so many other opportunities on the retail space. Um, I'm just not sure that you know it's necessary. All the other cons to go with it. So we're not where you guys are, but we sold 2,400 service agreements last month, which I'm pretty proud of because we sold about 100 in February. <laughs> so it's it's what gets managed what's get measured gets managed and it's yeah. one of those things where you've got to just you've got to instill this into their scorecard and you got to constantly be coaching on these things it's not like you just say hey we're starting a service agreement go sell it or go recruit people it's you you, you got to slowly and continuously I, you, gotta I, I, drive it. you gotta drive it you gotta drive it every day you gotta like anything else you gotta drive it every day People need to understand the vision and, and the plan, and you got to man it. You got to you got to shine a light on it. You got to measure it. You got to provide feedback. Uh, you need to have a goal. Maybe it's the goal. Maybe it's thirty thousand by you know twenty twenty five. Get it up on a banner. Get it in front of folks. Make it everyone's job to do it, and drive it like anything else. And it's amazing how things get done when you do that, versus the you know the alternative. Hoping that it just happens on its own. Um, let me ask you another question. And, and, and this, so I, I, I was with two coaches of the Cardinals last night. We got an opportunity to go to a Q and a, and it's pretty enlightening because these guys say, you know, as much happens on the field, those three hours, we're working 18 hours a day, six days a week off the field. And the way that I relate that to home service is I just spent three and a half hours doing, uh, I do a, a special presentation an orientation with the new guys. There's 24 of them this month. And I take them through everything I've learned and why we do things a certain way. But that's what I call practicing off the field. I don't want people learning to do garage doors in customers' houses. And so we, we, I, when I used to play football, we did two a days, we'd practice twice a day to play one game a week. And some days those were on weekends. And I think that whole concept of home service, here's a wrench, follow me for two weeks and you'll be good. We we do two months of training before you're even, and then we do polishing for another two weeks. So you're almost a quarter of your life. And then there's ride alongs coming back to Phoenix, retrain, training the trainer, constant, 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 uh, an investment into the people. What is your take on that? I mean, I, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, you have, you have to do that. People don't need to understand the direction and understand the plan. They also need the tools. Um, and you need, you need strong, you need, you know, you know, it's all about, it's all about, we like to say, it's all about the man, not the land, right. Or, or woman, but in this case, you know, inclusive sense, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's amazing how many folks go through business. They don't write down a business plan. They don't really have any personal goals. Uh, they don't, and, and, and as a result, folks in the direction, it's just kind of operating without this roadmap. Nobody really knows what's going just kind of, maybe you get lucky every now and then you have a good year. Um, but in the end, you're not going to get to where you want to, you want to get to. So, but you got to communicate that strategy as well. People need to know where the company's going. Uh, and so you have to, you have to invest in that. I mean, it's great that you do that, but you, you've got to, you know, uh, that message has to make its way and it's tough. We've got over 6,000 employees. I can't possibly get in front of everyone. It's just not, it's just not humanly possible as much as I would love to. So we have to find ways to do it differently, get the message to, to locations who then can take that message down all the way down the rank and file uh, to make sure that we're all, you know, pulling, pulling the cart in the same direction. It's not easy. It's tough to do. And it's, it's, you know, it's a tough job and it's a stressful job, but you have to, you have to do that. And football teams, I mean, look, there's great sports analogies that transcend the business. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it's amazing how many, 
how many successful sports people come out of sports and and help and talk and speak in front of business leaders because i mean it, it, it's you know it, it's all the same in the end you know i'm working on a book called elevate build a business which everybody could win and the main focus is as much as i could tell people we're gonna hit 200 million whatever they don't give two shits it's what what's in it for me so what you just said is perfect because it goes right into what i like to to work on with the company is wait a minute you could have all these kpis conversion rate tracking service agreement service to sales but what if we worked, you said you meet all these business owners, but what if we worked with each and every technician, CSR, dispatcher, warehouse manager, and said, I love performance pay, right? So what are your goals this year? And I'm going to dare you to dream a little bit bigger. What do you want out of life? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? Do you want to go to Disneyland? What, what do you want to do with your family? Do you want to own a home? And then from there, let's figure out what needs to happen. Not this year, not this quarter, but this month, this week, today. And let's work in reverse order because now when I'm talking to you, I can say, Ken, you came to me and we worked on a personal budget. We told you what needed to happen. And I'm willing to get you all the help in the world. All you got to do is ask. And we're going to have one-on-ones and I'm going to try to make you the best version of yourself. And what's in it for you now? You told me you wanted to take your dad on this fishing trip. You told me you wanted to own a home. You told me you wanted to get her out of credit card debt. And I feel like it's our obligation to help them dream a little bigger but to tell them what needs to happen at work to make those dreams come true. And when they see what's in it for them, it's amazing how things can change. I I think you're, I think you're spot on. And, and and I think it's awesome that you do that. I do the same thing with my son. My son's 20 years old. He's in, he's in college and, you know, he's a smart kid, but he, you know, he's a big dreamer, but nothing's written down. He's got some things in his head. Um, I'm trying to get him to understand, write it down. So with him, and it's not even next year, it's this month. I'm going to read, I'm going to read this book kind of, kind of, he's a little bit younger, right? So it doesn't have all the life experience that, that folks that are working for us may have, but you know, for him, it's, it's, it's write it down and then tape it uh, to the mirror in your bathroom and look at it every single day. Every time you walk in there, brush your teeth, you know, take a shower, whatever, look at it, remind yourself of what that, what that goal is that, you know, and that's the 15th. I didn't read, I didn't start that book or, you know, I want to do whatever, whatever it is. And so rather than, rather than have those goals too far out, which are sometimes hard for people to grasp, break it down into shorter, shorter time frames, where it's just easier to, easier to, 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 to grasp it. And so, but I think it's the same. I mean, it, you know, you know, for the tech, it may be, it may be a motorcycle. I want a motorcycle next year. Well, let me show you how you can do it and, and lay it out. It's, it's amazing how many people do not write their goals down or business owners that don't write down their business plan <laughs> and involve others in the organization to help get there. Yeah. You, you know, right? you're, it, it, well, having a budget, and then having a budget that you could actually hit. We're within like 3% of our budget. I mean, now that doesn't include, it changes when you do M&A, but because you got to add their EBITDA into it. But yeah, I, I think that's so important. That's the number one reason why companies fail is they don't know how to budget properly, write down goals and understand how to use data. It's so funny. We bought a company a little over a year ago. And when we got them on service site and they self-corrected almost overnight. They were like, holy crap, we didn't know this dispatcher was this bad. We need to retrain. They didn't know that this tech had this bad of conversion rate. They didn't understand. So when they realized the data that was accurate, because we've got a data integrity team, it's amazing how people are like, whoa. Or if you show them in numbers, we built out a calculator for the technicians that they plug in all their stuff and it goes, here's how much you can make a week. But it's great to see a year and a quarter and a month, but it's great to see a week. And to say, if we moved you from here to here, this is what would happen. So this is what's in it for you. And I, what I would figure it out, Ken, is if their dreams come true, so, so do ours. So do our budget. So do everything. And there's awesome. there's a reason for everybody to win. And I wanted to, while well, we got a few minutes left, what do you feel about equity incentive programs? I, I love them. You know, we, we, we do adhere to, to an extent. You know, with 6,000 employees, it's difficult. But it's a, you know, it's a thing that that I think is gaining steam uh where and you know private equity 
one of the things that private equity has brought to the home services space uh, and other, other spaces as well is the ability to do that in a way that would be very difficult for you to for you and I to do it as an individual business owner because it creates it creates tax implications uh, for folks. And it's just hard to give equity without it creating uh, taxable um, challenges for, for the folks on the other end. And so private equities through, through, you know, profits, interests, profits, units has this mechanism to be able to do that. And I think it's great. I mean, I, you know, uh, I wish we could have at the beginning, it's tough for us now with our size, but I wish at the beginning that we would have started this in, in, a, in a way that we could have, we could really have reached almost everyone in the organization and give everyone some equity. Cause I think, I do think that's a game changer. Um, you know, people want to have skin in the game. They want to work for a cause. They want to have they want to have skin in the game. Uh, they want to be aligned. Uh, they want to have opportunity. So I think it's it's um, it's something I think over time, over the next five to ten years, you're going to hear more and more about. Uh, led by primarily the private equity space, uh, we we do that today, but we don't have. You know, it certainly doesn't it doesn't go that deep or deep enough, perhaps. Um, but uh, I, I do like it. Uh, I think it's important. I think it's great for business. Uh, you know, certainly helps your retention. Uh, it's an incentive for people to stay long term, hang their hat, and uh, and do the tough things. Right? I mean, business is hard. We make tough decisions every day. It's not easy. And getting people to buy in to some of the things that you want to do, we all want to do as as, as leaders and owners. Um, that buy in is tough. So I like it. Um, I love it. Uh, I'm going to just go try to ask you a few more quick questions to get you out of here. Do you got anything starting in one minute? No, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't want to be inconsiderate of your time. Um, so one of the guys has mentioned in the chat over here is that he says that the PE companies and the roll-ups, they're making it impossible to compete. Now, uh, you know, I was the guy in a truck running all the calls. So I, I understand what it's like. Luckily, I got in in the early 2000s. But now that we're big data, we understand insights. But we have company. Like, literally, I have 10 full-time recruiters, 10 full-time trainers. We've got a special relationship with Dodge, with the Sprinter, uh, Pro Masters. We worked really hard to build this up into a real company. Yeah. And I'm not going to belittle anybody and say the guy selling fruit on the corner is not a real business. But the problem is if he doesn't show up, the business doesn't run. So I always ask people, is that something to where you really feel like you're best off competing when you can't, when you go to sleep at night, are you still making money? Because I promise you, if me and you were to go to Hawaii for a month, my company would not skip a beat. Now, hopefully some of them would miss me, but they wouldn't. Some of them wouldn't, I promise you. But ultimately, what do you say to somebody that says, man, these guys are impossible to compete with. They're buying, that we can't outbid them in pay-per-click. I, I think there's something to be said about creating relationships. It's David and Goliath. Goliath still won that, or David still won that battle against Goliath. So ultimately, what, what do you say to somebody that's saying, yeah, Ken sounds great and all, but he's putting us out of business? Yeah. Well, you know, rising tides rise rise all boats and i think i don't know about i don't know about the the, the overhead door space right the garage space i will tell you and i don't know how big tommy you can tell me how big how big you know how big is the space nationally for for overhead uh, i'm not happy with the study we did but it's between 14 and 15 billion just residential retro massive um hvac plumbing and electrical is about 130 billion private equity owns less than 10 percent of it so the, the, our spaces, our space, the home services space, the ones that we, we operate in, um, sure, private equity is, has, has acquired a lot of companies, but they're still relatively small. It's still a mom and pop space, and it's always going to be largely a mom and pop space, especially spaces that, that have a lower barrier of entry that it's easier to get in, get started, get rolling, doesn't take a ton of capital, uh, maybe some investment. Um, and then some some real grind, but there's no question that I think, but I do I think it's good for the for us all of us because, you know they want to grow, 
they want to professionalize it. It's been largely an unprofessionalized, undercapitalized mom and pop business for a long time. I think they're shining a light on that. And it, I, I think ultimately it will help, right? Maybe they are driving up cost per pay-per-click. Uh, they certainly have deeper pockets. They will spend money. I just think it's going to, it's going to create the need for you to get better for the, for your asker. I mean, you, uh, you know, audience, I mean, focus on things you haven't focused on, deliver better customer service. You can do that. Uh, you know, be smarter about how you go about business, hire, hire better people. Um, uh, you know, work on work on retention. Uh, you know, you know things that you can build capacity to compete and be able, be able to get out to people quicker when other mom and pops can. So I think there's I think there's ways for you to compete. I hear what you're saying though, but but I do think it will rise all boats, and over time, you know, it's it's the space is always going to be dominated by by the independently owned and operated. It's just going to it's just so big with so much white space. That is, it's it's massive. I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Yeah, I think that's it's great. You can focus on other things like relationships and affiliate marketing with the people you know. And I can't go to a B and I meeting right now. I don't have the time. So there's a lot of opportunities that are more deeper ingrained into the community. You know, I used to hate the word corporate when I was young because to me it meant coffee drinking, slow moving. And now there's a word for me that everybody says, Tommy's very entrepreneurial. And what I take by that, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, is I like to get things moving. Now, maybe they're not as thought out. We fall down a little bit along the way. But I don't like to go to a committee and say, hey, guys, maybe next week we could talk about an idea and get it done in a month. And then maybe it's it's I don't like the idea of slowing down. I don't like the idea. So now I take entrepreneurial as a really good thing, but I'm just curious because corporate to me is like you're kissing your boss's ass. You're trying to move to that next level. Uh, you know, it, it, all of a sudden there's rumors and it just, uh, I just want to be more family oriented. And if that's call me small business, call me entrepreneurial. What does that mean to you? Well, I, I don't like the word corporate either. I mean, as, as it relates to, you know, our, our structure wrenches the parent, if you will, and that's corporate. Um, but I don't like big, slow, bureaucratic um, um, organizations, and we're not that. And so, you know, we work, we work really hard to not be that. I mean, sometimes you, you get caught sometimes and things slow down and there's some bottleneck, but we're very, very careful to not create that environment for all of our wrench, you know, um, locations and partners. Uh, I'm not going to say it never happens, but we, we really, you know, it, it, you know, if you think about our size and how many people we have supporting locations, it's small. We only have, we'll have 60 this year in a business that'll do, you know, 1.4, 1.5 billion. That's not a big overhead if you think about it. Um, so we, we, we try we try to focus on things that that make sense that we can if we can't do it better and more efficiently and and assume it doesn't change culture we, we, we don't do it we just don't do it uh, but if we don't we're not this big bureaucratic corporate machine um, but I think I think at the location level you know maybe moving to the location level I mean I think the same thing you know pe people people want to work for a cause they want to work for a leader they can get behind. Um, you know, they, 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 you know, they want someone who, who is a great listener, who's appreciative, who has humility. Here's a term for your folks. I forget where I heard this, but, you know, be interested, not interesting. I don't know if you ever heard that, Tommy. Yeah, I did. I like right. that. Isn't that great? I tell my, again, I tell my son that all the time. My son wants to be the life of the party. It's like, you know what? Actually, take a minute to slow down and listen to other people. It's not about you. It's not about you. Be interested, not interesting. And so that's how I've always run my business prior to Wrench when I owned Cool Ray. Uh, and, I, and I was a big part of the culture. And then, you know, servant leadership. You're here for people and you build trust. Uh, that's, that's really been my philosophy. And it's been pragmatic in that two things always come first. Our team and our customer. So everything we do is grounded in those two things. How does it impact? And so every decision we make, how does it impact the customer? And how does it impact 
our employees. And if it doesn't impact them both in the right way, you don't do it. And, that, and that's really been my, I'm going to break it down to, you know, to easy. That's really how I've operated my business and now, uh, you know, uh, corporate as well. You know, I, I have a philosophy in the new book that says when you build a company that everybody wins. So I work on OKRs for the vendors. What's your one year goal? What's your three year goal? How do I help you get there? What markets aren't doing well that I could go into that you could help me out? How could we get my guys loaded out quicker? But what do you need? The customers, the clients got to win. The the My internal customers got to win first because if they're happy, my customers will then help be happy. The partnerships all got to work and they got to win when we go in and consolidate or, or, you know, my favorite word in the world. And I thought this was like cheating. I thought this couldn't exist. I've learned it a long time ago. It's the word arbitrage. And the way I learned it is these clipper ships in the 1860s. They used to go from New York to San Francisco and they could get there in three days, the fastest ships on the sea. And they'd buy something for 10 cents and sell it for a dollar because in San Francisco during the gold rush, you needed tennis shoes, you needed supplies and so, sure. and what, you know, so that's arbitrage. When you buy in a market and sell it in a different market, it's arbitrage. And, and what gives companies value is there's certain thresholds you hit that you figured out systematic approaches to, to getting an outcome you want. Okay. Our outcome, a key result. And the systems are starting to run the company. Michael Gerber, uh, the E-Myth Revisited. What is arbitrage to you and how important is it? Do you love the word like I do? Oh, I love it. Well, you knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, that's that's really what we're doing. That's how that's how private equity makes money. And everyone else who's coming along for the ride uh, makes money is through arbitrage. And so, you know, how do we leverage? How do we buy? To your example, I mean, it's spot on. How do you buy something for a dollar and sell it for 10? That's, you know, that's the arbitrage, right? And so... You know, we're trying we're trying to build a business um, and we're buying companies along the way, right? At, at X multiples and at X dollars. We've got to continue to grow them and organically is the best. You know, here's the deal. If you want arbitrage, big secret. Don't tell me when I told you this. Grow organically. Grow organically. Well, the rule of seven, if you grow 10% a year, seven years in a row you just screw a hundred percent and guess what and you and you didn't spend you know 15 times somebody's earnings to buy them which now you got to sell at 20 to get some arbitrage right or on on the multiple and so grow organically invest in ways to grow your business organically and then everything else m a is icing on the cake right find great partners in great markets I already not to repeat myself, but great companies, great leaders, great markets, great cultures, and stretch for them and then help them grow and make them even bigger and bigger. You know, we partnered with Parker, um, you know, in 2015, Parker was around, gosh, I want to say 80 million, 75 million in sales, maybe 200 million this year. That's all, that's all organic. I'm not even including a couple of deals we did that are growing like crazy as well with with um, uh, with the Greenfield in Tucson. That's just Parker and Sons. So think of that arbitrage. Uh, that's all organic growth. It doesn't. I mean that that's that's where it's at, and that's why we're focused on all the things those enablers I mentioned. We're focused on things that help organically grow the business and get some leverage on the bottom line. Just get a little better every day and add just a little more leverage, and that's so how you, that's how you get it. I've always looked up to Paul. He's always been in my backyard. I've been watching these guys at the 16th hole and um, the waste management. And Josh has always been. Yeah, be. I'm sure that was pretty, pretty. Sad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul. About his three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Paul and I get along great. He's just, he's probably one of the best operators out there. I mean, there's Geiger, you know, there's you, there's Ken, there's Goodrich, there's, there's, um, um, lots of great operators, uh, but Paul just, what, what would you have to say? Because he's your biggest, he's the biggest wing of wrench group. The one thing, you know, Phoenix and Tucson now, 
What, what would you say if you had to give me a few qualities that you see in him? Well, I know, I know, um, I know Paul for a long time. We go, we go way back. Paul grew up in, in the Rotor Root organization. I mentioned Rotor Root. I was part of that as well. So we go back 30 years. Uh, and so I've known him a long time. I can tell you all the bad qualities too, but you, you don't want those. <laughs> Paul's a great, and, and, and look, you know, one of the smartest things that he, that he did over the last several years is hire a guy named Daryl Bingham. And Daryl has been running that business really for, for a long time. Paul's been involved. Paul's kind of taken more of a regional approach, but Daryl has been really turning the dials and pulling the levers. Paul's been a part of it. Paul's passion is marketing. So no surprise that his son, Josh, is, is, has got into marketing as well. And so that's his passion, really growing businesses and, and the marketing. He wrote a little book called Ta-da, right? I don't know if you saw it. Yeah. A lot, a lot of his marketing tr uh, tricks in that, in that book. Um, but, you know, he was also smart to understand that you've got to get the right people in the business alongside you. Uh, and so outside of marketing, that's what he did. And, and, and Daryl's the operator. Uh, that's the glue in that business and, and a huge supporting cast as well of, of good operators beneath beneath him that uh, have gotten that business where it is today. So Paul, Paul's passion is marketing. Uh, that's really, if he, if he was here, that's what he would tell you. Yeah. And that's the, usually great founders are great marketers and they're good at sales. La uh, last close out questions here. I do this with everybody is if someone wants to reach out to you, I know you're a busy man. Is it, LinkedIn a good source. Where's the best way to, to reach yeah. out? Yeah, you can give me a LinkedIn or you could or you can you could shoot me an email at, at uh khanes at wrench group .com and uh I'll get I'll get back to folks. Happy to take questions offline. I know that um you're familiar with some of the books I am like E Myth and um what I found is being around successful people, being on podcasts with a guy like you reading books, readers are leaders. Is there any books that you recommend? Some of them, Napoleon Hill and, and uh, you know, they ask you answer. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite book is uh, Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. Is there anything that you'd recommend for reading? I've read that one, read all, all of his books uh, and went and did a lot of his, his, Jim be doing his workshops where you got to get up. I mean, talk about being young and getting up in front of a group at a Dale Carnegie meeting uh, and having to having to speak. You know, when you're when you're 20, 22, uh, you love to speak. So for you, it's probably super super natural. But <laughs> you know, it's funny. Full disclosure, I'm a little a little um, ADD. So growing up, I can never sit still long enough to read a book. I started reading a little bit later in life, but a couple of books that I, that I you know for those that you know, really want to figure out strategy and put together a plan. I mean, one of the best books that I read was it's called Strategy Pure and Simple Too. It's, it's you know, how winning companies um, dominate their competition. I think it's by a guy named uh, Mike Robert. My boss gave me that book back in 97 uh, uh, to read. And out of it came a template uh, one, get the impetus to, to do it, right? It's hard work and how to involve your team and do it. But from that, uh, a template that was born, that had to, had to put together a real strategic operating plan uh, for your business. So that's the one I would recommend. The other one is, I like leadership books. I mean, one of my favorites, probably uh, a guy named Rick Pitino, uh, you know, a great, you know, he's the first coach, you know, to bring, you know, three different teams to the final four. Uh, super highly successful. Uh, uh, guy that doesn't take shortcuts, um, and, and for and the book is around how to build an inspiring uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, basketball for him, business for us, and so that's a book. Uh, it's called Success is a Choice, I believe, if I remember. And you know, I've read you know Good to Great, it's another great book for those uh, you know starting a business to really understand um, how to operate and think about things in terms of people. So, you know, good to great, Rick Pitino, success is a choice, and then strategy, pure and simple, would be the three. And then the Dale Carnegie books are great. Uh, those are great reads, pretty quick quick reads. But, you know, I should probably read more. It's just that, uh, you know, I'm old now. I'm, I'm in bed by 8 o'clock. I, I pick up a book, <laughs> and, I'm, I'm a, and I fall asleep. So it's, uh, 
You know, Leland mentioned a book at Rhino X, which I wanted to speak real quick about, but he mentioned Bob, Bob Pfeiffer, how to double your business in six months or less. And it was a book written in the nineties. And it really is about getting controls of the money. Cause I think the financing side of things and knowing when to grow and when to not grow and understanding that some people in your organization will spend your money quicker than you could make it. So understanding where the money's going. Um, but you know, you've got Rhino X coming up. I love Chris Shano, Great guy. You're going to be there with, with a lot of very successful. Yeah. I missed business. it last year. I missed it last year. It was uh, my wife that booked a vacation out of the country. So but I'm looking forward. I did it the first year. I'm looking forward to getting back. Yeah. I like, I like, uh, like Chris and he's doing a great job and that'll be a lot of fun. Well, sure. hopefully I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I'm invited. So um, I enjoy watching you guys, just some of the, the leaders of the, I, I love the fact that I could take what you guys have done and anybody, uh, my podcast is to all home services. The success leaves clues. And if you yeah. can take what HVAC has done, HVAC has always been the leader, lots of brilliant people in HVAC. It could be applied to other industries. And I just love that concept. Uh, and you know what? It's not, you know, if you think about it, you break it down. It's not unlike what we do, wrench and how we're built, where it's a lot of collaboration. It's a, you know, we've got some of the best businesses in the business and we're learning from one another, right? Versus jamming it down your throat. Um, and there's more than one best practice. There's lots of best practices can be born on a, on a subject. So, so that's great. I'm, I appreciate what you're doing and uh, keep it up and uh, keep it cranking. Well, here's the last question, Ken. We talked about a lot of stuff. I, I have a little bit of ADHD, but I had a lot of questions in mind, so I try to stay in home service. We talked about arbitrage, an equity incentive program, you know, everything from uh, <laughs> setting up a business for success, commercial versus residential versus box stores. Well, there might be something we didn't talk about or just a final thought to leave the audience with. And this is where I turn it over to you to just leave the final thought to the audience. This has been amazing. You're amazing for taking the time to do this with, with me and, and the listeners. And um, I'm thankful for it. So I'll let you close us out. No, I, I appreciate the kind words. I guess, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, have a great story for those that are, whether you're just starting out in business and, and you've got a lot of runway to get to where you want to be, where you may consider selling it one day. Um, and you should all have a plan, succession plan to do that. Be thinking about that. Always be thinking about that. But have a great story. I mean, um, you know, I, I love businesses that have track records of, of great revenue growth that are, con that are consistent over time, earning strong management teams, great cultures. They have a lot of fun. They work hard. They play hard. Um, and again, people want to work for um, a cause. So what's your cause? Create a cause. I, I may, maybe, maybe it's you know, maybe it's a charity. Maybe it's something that your organization is working towards. So uh, develop a cause, create a cause, get people rallied around that cause. You'd be surprised as to how 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 great that is. We we do that on the local level versus driving it primarily from from Wrench Group corporate because uh, all the people are in the field. They're not here, and so it works for us. But uh, and just and have fun. You got to have fun. Business is tough. You go home frustrated. Uh, it's, you know, it's sleepless nights, but um, you know, I'll pay off. Uh, and, and think about, think about it in chunks. I mean, for us, it's, and for you, it should be just get, how do I get just a little bit better? Chris, Paul Smith, our CEO says this all the time. How do we get better? Just a little bit better every day. It doesn't have to be hugely better, just a little bit better. How do we continue to just get better every single day? Uh, that's all you need to do. And, and in the end, uh, you'll, you'll look back and say, geez, I've gone from, Five million to fifty million, and uh, you'll you'll be you'll be a dominant player in your in your market. So I guess that's it. I hadn't thought about that. So that's off the uh, it's off the cuff, Tommy. Um, it's really great. It's yeah. great. It's fascinating. I can't wait to see you. Uh, it's in short order here. Thank you for your time again, Ken. You're, you're brilliant, and um, your record yeah. shows it. And uh, I just appreciate the fact you're a great dad and a great husband along the way. So. Keep up the great work. I wish you all the best. Can't wait to see you. And uh, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy. All right. Thanks, Be my good. friend.
We'll Thanks see you. Everybody. Appreciate it.